Good morning. Welcome to the 6 a.m. press conference here on the CZU Lightning Complex. My name is Jonathan Cox, Deputy Chief with CAL FIRE San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit and Line Officer on the incident. As always, if you could just make sure that you keep your phones muted in the press conference area, as well as take any conversations uh, outside. We also ask that you keep your masks on at all times. There will be a chance at the end for questions and answers for the representatives that are up here. Uh, just a quick update this morning. As of 600, we are now standing at 81,333 acres, 81,333. We can confirm that we have 21% containment. There are, however, still over 23,000 structures threatened by the fire. Unfortunately, we can confirm that there have been 646 structures that have been destroyed. 11 of those structures are in San Mateo County and uh, 635 of them are in Santa Cruz County. With that, our uh, personnel numbers continue to increase as more resources arrive at scene, and we now have 1,982 firefighting personnel on the line. With that, I'll transition right over to an operations uh, briefing from CAL FIRE IMT3, Op Section Chief Mark Brunton. Good morning. So uh, the past few days, as I mentioned, we've had a lot of good success about establishing more control lines around the fire, uh, being able to get deeper into the fire, continue to extinguish uh, fire around homes, and, uh, and start uh, creating a more safe environment as we are uh, entering more towards a uh, repopulation potential down the road. So just uh, again, in the, uh, the north zone of our fire, we're starting to see a lot of great progress in that north zone. Again, uh, our line is held in Division Gulf and Kilo. Uh, again, that uh, is just in a patrol and mop-up status, and that has really protected any uh, movement of the fire uh, it, towards Santa Clara County. We're very, very confident that that's, that's going to hold and that's going to maintain. Uh, around Butana Park, again, the fire is just slowly creeping uh, down towards our control line where we could best take advantage of suppression activities. Um, again, the weather uh, has really mitigated the, the progression of the fire, uh, which is good. Uh, but as far as the operation getting down to fully extinguish it, it it's a slow, painstaking process, but uh, we're getting there. Continuing as we move down towards the coast, as you see the black lining on the, the, the map, uh, again, that's an uh, area that's been extinguished. We're going in putting control line around it so that we are very confident that that part of it's fully controlled. And uh, we're, we're getting a lot of progress along that way, and, and we have uh, uh, folks patrolling that, making sure that that is completely and fully out. Uh, moving down towards Davenport, a lot of great, great progress there. The utility companies are in there working diligently so that we can uh, restore that community so it's operational. Um, the Highway 1 corridor, uh, Caltrans has worked diligently to make sure that that's open and, uh, and uh, ready to uh, receive uh, people uh, on that uh, roadway. On our south end of the fire, you'll see some black line here, and we'll continue to put black line on the map uh, as uh, the, the next coming days. Our line is holding uh, very well in that area and our secondary line, of course, so for the protection of the UC campus, which was uh, just recently repopulated, and for the community of Santa Cruz, they're in very good shape, uh, especially with the oncoming weather that we're going to be seeing in the next couple of days where it's going to start getting uh, warmer, drier, and we'll see a bit of a north wind of, uh, produced uh, and, and pushing on that line. Uh, it'll give us a good wind test, and that'll really um, val validate for us uh, that line and, and it being able to hold with, uh, with, with a lot of confidence. Around Felton, we have good line around three quarters of Felton, and uh, yesterday the big uh, story was uh, burning uh, operation that was going on on the uh, the north end and uh, tying into the bottom end of Ben Loman on a line that has been established. Uh, that had to be delayed due to the weather uh, in particular. Uh, it just wasn't conducive for the burning conditions, so that we wanted to get the right conditions to get the most effective burn possible. The uh, firing operation, burn operation, uh, ended up starting later in the day, around 3 to 4 in the afternoon, uh, and it, uh, we had to take it uh, slow. It was a slow, painstaking process, so that delayed that, but um, what I personally witnessed, uh, it was going very well. Um, we had adequate resources. We had highly qualified resources in there so that we had a very safe, effective burn, and uh, they were able to get probably about uh, just over half, almost three-quarters done. They'll continue that process today. Um, won't say it's the easier leg of the, the burn, but it is one that we're very comfortable with, and it's just the weather uh, is what we're doing. So they've stopped it up, make sure that we uh, don't uh, continue on and, and have not an effective burn. So we want to make sure it's effective and efficient, and that will continue today. So it will produce smoke. Uh, yesterday afternoon in the light daylight hours, 
uh, people saw a lot more smoke production. That's what it was. And that's normal. That uh, showed that we were having an effective burn when we had the smoke production that we, we had. So even from a distance, I could tell they were doing great work. Moving up the Highway 9 corridor, uh, the communities of Ben Loman, uh, Boulder Creek, looking really good. We have line being punched in behind those communities. It's just slow, arduous work, again, due to the topography and the fuel loading. We've gotten an influx of a lot of resources throughout yesterday. All day long, I saw messages coming in from my, uh, my operations section chiefs that divvy out the resources as we receive them to, the, to my other uh, partners that run the north and south zone. And we were divvying out those resources accordingly to our needs and our strategy pr uh, priorities. And uh, we were seeing everything from engines. We were seeing crews, which we desperately need. We were seeing our type one crews. So everything was, uh, was showing up that we needed. And um, we were putting them directly to work. Uh, we were also saving a few of them so that we balance out our shift because they work a 24-hour shift. We don't want to overload one shift and not have a, a shift that isn't uh, fully staffed. So we're doing a balancing act on top of that. Uh, so today, again, we have a very robust shift uh, to be able to tackle this, uh, this challenge. The rest of it's looking really good as we're moving up uh, Highway 236. Uh, Caltrans is in there working so we can gain access even further and deeper and get into the, the park. Um, Bonnie Dune, same thing. We've got uh, County Roadworks uh, along with our uh, specialty uh, road uh, crews that are going in. Getting that opened up so our inspection crews can get in there, that the utility companies, uh, we make it safe they can get in and start doing their work. Uh, I know PG&E has been in there in full force getting their uh, infrastructure up and running as well as the other utilities. So we're getting to that point where uh, they're getting their work done, we're getting our work done, and it's a very symbiotic in, uh, in this challenge. Uh, Air support. Yesterday, weather was not uh, helpful to that. Uh, we could not get any reconnaissance flights in. It wasn't until very late in the day we get any water dropping uh, flights in. So we didn't have as much success from the air yesterday. Uh, we feel moving forward with the um, oncoming weather, we are going to have a lot more success. Go back to how we were a few days ago, timing out our aircraft, dropping lots of water in support of our ground troops, and uh, work another day closer to uh, accomplishing our mission and, and getting this, uh, this done and people back where they want to be at back at home. Speaking next from the Santa Cruz County Sheriff's Office is Chief Deputy Chris Clark. Good morning. Uh, fairly quiet night uh, for us out in the field. Uh, there were no arrests, no citations as we continue kind of that trend, which is a good thing. Last night we had 60 officers and deputies uh, that were patrolling. Uh, today we'll have a, a 42, 21 from the sheriff's office, 14 from our in-county partners, and then seven mutual aid uh, folks from over the hill. Uh, in terms of calls for service, we responded to 10 welfare checks last night and three suspicious people. On a positive note, and really thanks for uh, the public's help on this, is that we located one of the three missing people that we had still outstanding. So Mr. Ranke has been located. And I uh, just want to say thank you for those that, uh, that called in and, and helped us with that. So we still have, uh, so our, that brings our total to two. And so we'll, again, we, we just encourage if you've heard from those two people, their pictures, their information is on our Facebook page. So take a look at that. And if you, again, if you recognize them or you know them, either have them call us or, uh, or you call us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, another thing we were doing, and, and just for folks at home, uh, animal services, you know, they've been kind of inundated with, uh, with animal, um, requests to feed animals and and to check on animals we're assisting them with that last night our folks uh, did over a hundred hit over a hundred different homes uh, in assisting animal services with uh, taking care of pets that were unfortunately left behind so we're uh, animal service doing everything they can to get out there and, and we're helping them with that and then obviously as we I spoke about last night repopulation so that's really kind of where our focus is now in addition to security obviously and welfare checks but uh, uh, with repopulation, I just want to reiterate uh, to folks uh, who've been displaced um, to know your zone. I mentioned that yesterday, you know, going to the Cal, going to Cal Fire's website, taking a look at uh, the incident fact sheet for this fire and understanding kind of where and what zone you reside. And then again, watching to see and, and, and you know, and following the right channels, right? So Cal Fire, our social media, making sure it's a, a, a trusted source and then checking that map and, and uh, so there's more information to come. There's going to be a lot more information as, as we go as we go along. But those uh, making sure that you're checking those resources and, and then taking a look again at that map to know what zone you're in. So uh, definitely know your zone. 
and then uh, and then waiting at checkpoints. So you know, I mentioned last night that uh, you know I can understand people's uh, rush to get back. I would I would want to get back home, uh, but what we don't want to see, and what I want to assure you is that. Uh, um, is that you know we want to do this as systematic uh, as possible to be able to get people in as efficiently as possible. So definitely don't 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 feel like you have to you know wait at a checkpoint for more information. Uh, we will we will absolutely keep you the best informed so that we can get you home as fast as possible. And again, it's you know I, I think I mentioned this last night. Someone had mentioned, is it going to be a foot race between myself and, and some thief to my house? And that's that's not the case. So we we are going to maintain. We will maintain a presence. Uh, throughout the, uh, the, uh, the repopulation as we go along uh, to make sure that people are settled and safe and, and things are things are okay before before any of our any of our plans change so that uh, but what we don't want to see is a whole ton of people at the checkpoint just waiting it just makes that that, that process uh, less efficient but definitely keep uh, keep apprised of the different information sources uh, that are out there between Cal Fire and us and then lastly I just want to touch on Again, that damage assessment map we've said it. We've said it a few times. Uh, that uh, there's you know areas that are continuing to be uh, to be assessed. That map's going to continue to grow, but you can find all that at SantaCruzCounty.us, and that's SantaCruzCounty.us for damage assessment map as well as other resources uh, for folks that have been displaced. Thank you. Next, speaking on behalf of all of the unified incident commanders is Cal Fire Incident Management Team Three IC Billy C. Good morning. Obviously, one week ago, uh, we started a large evacuation process that moved uh, several thousand uh, residents out of the area, uh, both for their safety and the safety of our firefighters. Over the course of the next 48 hours, uh, we're going to be looking at repopulating different areas in and around this fire, making the recommendations with our law enforcement partners. Obviously, you heard it needs to be a coordinated and methodical process. We need to ensure that we have electricity. We need to ensure the roadways are safe to travel. We need to make sure that we have corridors for our firefighters to travel in and out of the fire area. We need to make sure the water is in place. That's a coordinated effort. It takes a lot of different uh, agencies to ensure this occurs. Obviously, the community Davenport you hear that we're working with PG&E in cooperation to get the electricity strung back in that area and get that secure to make it safe. Uh, the fire perimeter, each day we're gaining confidence as we increase our resources on this incident. Today, we're gonna have over a thousand firefighters out on that line working diligently to gain perimeter control. Each day we increase our containment efforts on this incident and we'll continue to do that until we have it 100% contained and we've been able to lift the majority of the evacuation orders and warnings in this area. Thank you. Uh, final speaker this morning, CAL FIRE San Mateo Santa Cruz Unit, Unit Chief Ian Larkin. Good morning. Um, we just want to reiterate, uh, the team's doing an outstanding job out there. They're working with our, uh, our cooperators, uh, getting our infrastructure back in place. <clears throat> this fire uh, burnt uh, through a lot of areas where it uh, took out our pg e electrical lines. It took out guardrails along roadways that are important to uh, make sure that people don't drive off the roadway and drive up into, in, you know, off into a ravine. So uh, it's going to take time. Um, we're just asking for your patience. Uh, the incident is working uh, diligently, as Chief C said. We have every available resource that we can that's out there uh, working in a safe manner to try to uh, mitigate this uh, incident as quickly as possible. Um, as I just want to reemphasize uh, um, what uh, Chief Deputy Clark said, um, for damage inspection, as that continues, the numbers continue to go up. Um, one day uh, you need to check that map every day, and uh, one day your house uh, may not be on there, and the next day as we continue damage inspection, more structures will be uh, added to that as they go through and find that out. And that, uh, that link on the, uh, to that map can be found at that santacruzcounty.us. Um, additionally, um, for the repopulation, um, the link to that map um, is smco.community.zonehaven. And that's smco.community.zonehaven. Uh, and that will take you to the interactive map 
um, that will allow you to see what zones are being repopulated. And as those zones are repopulated, um, you will see that uh, the zone will go from red to green uh, to indicate that that is a zone that has been repopulated or approved for repopulation. And once again, um, for those that have, uh, have identified uh, through the uh, damage inspection that your homes have uh, received some type of damage or have been destroyed, there are several resources out there uh, that I've stated before, but I just want to uh, reiterate that um, you can go to the uh, disasterassistance.gov. That's disasterassistance.gov. There's a lot of resources available to you to start that process um, for the recovery side. You can also download the FEMA app. Um, that will assist you uh, in getting started in that process with uh, the resources available from FEMA. Um, as we said, we're just asking for some additional patience here as we work through this uh, to make this environment as safe as possible for you to return uh, to the areas where you reside. Thank you. All right, with that, we're happy to answer any questions. Jonathan, the numbers of uh, homes destroyed, are they burning homes, or are you just guys going in there and now just looking at homes that were maybe burned days ago? Yes, the question is related to homes that have been destroyed, and uh, there's damage inspection teams that work for the uh, incident management team that are going through behind the fire to basically catalog all the damage and destruction through there. The, speaking with GC this morning, they're at about 55% complete of their process. And obviously what they're contending with, Will, at the moment is just getting deep into the fire perimeter with all the trees that are down, the power poles that are down, and the kind of the conditions that they're facing. So there, it's not new homes burned, say, yesterday. It's just counting the homes. Correct. Thank you, yep. uh, With regard to uh, repopulation or uh, evacuation zones, might be a question for Chris Clark. Um, there's some chatter on social media from uh, residents that are under the belief that they, they can get uh, police escorts back in. Um, can you clarify if that's the case? Uh, what are the, what what are some of those stipulations if that's possible or if not? Sure. The question is related to uh, what is the what is the uh, information regarding the rumor of uh, getting passes to get back in, and that would be one for the sheriff's department. Yeah. So as we've said uh, before, that really um, we've evacuated an area, and, and really to be able to better secure that area, to better facilitate the improvement of different infrastructure systems between water power and, and tree cutting and allowing Cal Fire to, re, you know, to make sure their lines are established and, and put this fire out, that's the focus. So there is no, there, 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 there's no system for passes or anything like that if you're not an essential, if you're not an essential worker on the fire. Um, and then, uh, does that answer your question, Tom? Uh, it was uh, police escorts. There, there's chatter that, there's, that there are police escorts that are letting people back in to gather things or to no, there, no escorts, uh, and in that, you know, and we totally understand. I mean, we, we know that people want to get back to their homes for, for things. Um, you know, if it's life-saving medication, we've said this before. If it's something, but, you know, uh, we've also uh, encouraged people that if you if you need it, if you could go a different route to obtain that sort of stuff, to do that. But uh, at this time, we're just trying to emphasize, you know, making sure that that area is clear for all those crews to be able to clean up the roads. You know, re put back the power, you know, restring the lines, re, uh, uh, redo water conduit, all that stuff, which is going to take time, but just giving them space to work. And that's, that's really where we're asking for, for patients, the quicker and the, the better that they can work, the faster that they're able to repair that stuff. While you're, oh, I'm sorry. While you're at the podium, um, you have two missing persons cases now. That's, that's correct. What happens to the other ones? They were found, they called in? Yes, combination of, combination of all that. You know, as I mentioned, we had detectives working on those. Uh, and we'll continue to work right now. Again, we have two. And I'll just reiterate again, if you haven't heard from a friend or a loved one that may be in this in the, in the evacuated area to definitely call us, we want to make sure they're okay just, to, just as, uh, as much as you do. So give us a call. We'll definitely we'll take a case on it, and we'll, we'll find them. Chris, is there a, an order of repopulating? Yesterday we heard about UCSC. Is there an order for, you know, is Scott Valley next, or is there... Do you have any idea? Yeah, so uh, great question. In terms of repopulation, how does that look? So from, and I mentioned this last night, from least affected to most affected, basically going from the outside in and then doing that in a systematic fashion. As I mentioned, Scotts Valley, last night I said day or days, you know, with regards to, to repopulating Scotts Valley. And that'll kind of be the case, you know, for those least affected areas. And then as we get obviously closer to the more heavily impacted areas, that time frame, that time frame goes up obviously because there's more damage to power, water, streets, and, and things like that. So just uh, 
Um, but yeah, it'll be kind of at least affected to uh, to the most affected. This is another question, I guess, for one of these other gentlemen. In terms of weather now, I mean, we've been having great luck with the weather. What's the forecast for the next couple of days? You know, or, or is it going to still be good? Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the forecast for the next coming days, and kind of the impact on the fire? As I've uh, stated before. Um, we have assigned to our team um, a, not only a fire behavior analyst, but a, uh, an IMED, an incident meteorologist, an actual meteorologist from the National Weather Service. And actually, he's been just joined by a trainee. Uh, so we've got actually two meteorologists uh, here on this incident. And the operations section, we work extremely closely. In fact, on, on our operations uh, trailer or office that we have here, um, we they're in our office. And that's how much we rely upon their information because we base all our actions on the current and expected weather. So that being said, um, we've been, they, the meteorologists do forecasts like meteorologists do and, and they analyze, I mean, minute by minute. They're sitting there and analyzing the data, crushing that data. And from that, they put out a, a really good matrix for us to follow. So, and, and they do it because uh, firefighters are kind of visual creatures. We, we learn that way and we, we operate that way. So they have a poster they put up at all of our briefings so that we can look at it and then analyze it, and, and and we can look days ahead. What what is that doing, and, and what are they look? We look at a lot of different things, metrics regarding that. So what's coming forward? Uh, we've had great weather, like you said. Uh, we've had a lot of production because of that weather. We are moving into a very uh, drier uh, set of days. Uh, temperature's going to go up. Our relative humidity is going to drop. Uh, with that, the fuel moistures, what little moisture they've been able to uh, obtain over this latest weather. That's going to drop, so the, the, the weather's hotter and drier, the fuels become drier, and uh, we are going to see some wind. We're going to see uh, a pattern which creates this dry uh, atmosphere, a north northwest wind, which typically is a challenge for us. Um, so with that, we uh, plan, we, we develop our strategy, we uh, change our strategy and our tactics to meet that need of the, and what the weather's going to do, um, and that kind of dictates what, how we're operating. But for our overall plan, it's not going to change anything dramatically. Uh, we are taking that into account. We're addressing that as part of our plan and moving forward, but we aren't going to see anything so dramatic uh, on this fire that uh, it's going to change anything or create a significant uh, change in the fire behavior. It'll increase it a little bit, but we're ready for it and, uh, and, and shouldn't be a problem for us. No, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to ding anybody out there, but hey, where else can you do about 50% and be pretty good, right? <laughs> and we give them bad time about that all the time, so it's, it's good natured. Real quickly, what was the challenge yesterday? Yesterday you were pretty optimistic about going up in the air and dumping just as much water. What happened from the 6 a.m. news conference until now? There's been a bit of turbulence. Yeah, uh, well, funny enough, it was the weather. <laughs> so, <laughs> what would you say about the weather, guys? Um, so, really, uh, yeah, and it, it was a bit unexpected. Again, it just shows the na uh, Mother Nature uh, playing with us, toying with us. Um, so, it wasn't expected that marine layer last as long as it, as it did. Uh, so, by the time it burned off, it was much later than we expected, anticipated. So, um, yeah, it's, it slowed down our, our production rate with our aircraft, but that's the thing and not to sound too cliche but we we do improvise and adapt and overcome so we don't weigh our entire plan on one certain aspect and something that that we've uh, we teach our, our new operations folks is that you, you do not uh, put or develop your plan around aircraft because there are so many variables uh, with that so it is an important tool it's a very valuable tool but it's not our only tool and because of that we uh, we have the plan adjustments so that when we can't fly the aircraft such as yesterday, we march on, we carry on with our mission and, and we accomplish our mission. Randy Gordon with uh, KBCZ Boulder Creek Community Radio. Um, with regard to repopulation, can you elaborate on any protocol for distinguishing the difference between a resident uh, in one zone that's been, uh, the evacuation's been lifted versus the neighboring zone where the evacuation has not been lifted. So your question is really about kind of the specifics of how when you release a zone, uh, it's controlled between two different zones. Right. Yeah. And how you distinguish between two residents that show up and say one's right on the border of a neighboring zone that's been lifted. Sure. I'll let uh, uh, the sheriff's office answer that. 
Yeah, so in terms of the zones, you know, obviously knowing what zone you're in is important, but at the same time, like, we're, there's, there's a system in place on our end uh, where we're going to be checking to make sure, because obviously having a bunch of people show up at a checkpoint and, and all of them, you know, uh, or, you know, there's people that could say, hey, I'm in that zone, there's going to be a vetting process to make sure that that's, that that's the case, and that's because we don't want to obviously uh, send people into an area that, uh, that's been evacuated that could pose a, a, a threat to... Uh, not only the security of that area, people are trying to get in there, you know, for the sake of looting, which, you know, hopefully is not the case, but also to give people space to be able to work, as I mentioned before. So there'll be a vetting process at, at, uh, at the checkpoints and making sure that, uh, that when, we, when people go back, that they're going back to the right areas. All right. Uh, just as we close, for the media uh, specifically, as you're in and around the fire area, we just ask that you be extremely careful. Uh, it is dangerous in there. Trees are falling, and we just ask, please, please be careful in there and look up at where you're at. Uh, we will have another uh, press conference this evening at 6 p.m. Thank you for joining us. This concludes the 6 a.m. press conference.